Welcome to The Wrench, where I talk about games and the words we use to discuss them. Today I want to share a video I wrote almost two years ago. When I wrote it, I was filled with hope for games in the gaming community, and I was desperately trying to follow in the footsteps of several prominent figures who I deeply admired. Since then, the events surrounding Gamergate have all but destroyed that optimism, along with my respect for a certain individual mentioned in this video. As a result, I almost scrapped this entirely, but I think it's important to revisit stuff like this. It's important to remember why games seemed worthwhile to begin with, even when it hurts to do that sometimes. I'm at my grandparents' house. I've brought my Sega Genesis, my most prized possession, and plugged it into the massive looming obelisk that is their CRT television. I start Sonic the Hedgehog 2 and play through the first level, and I'm blown away by the picture quality and the sound. Every glorious pixel and every amazing beep bursting from the screen massive and crisp. It's a world of difference from the tiny staticky television with broken buttons and tinny sound that I inherited from my parents. Yet, despite the opportunity to play my then favorite game of all time on a TV that isn't older than I am, I pause the game in the middle of the second level, Chemical Plant Zone, and I step away from the screen. I find my grandfather and I start trying to tell him about the level I had just been playing. I struggle with a child's vocabulary to describe exactly what it is about the level that captivates me so. I babble what must be particularly dense child gibberish about an area full of tubes and machines carrying pink water and blue globs, where a blue hedgehog needs to jump a lot and run really fast. I realize none of what I'm saying makes sense, so I attempt to provide context. I try to relate the story of the evil Dr. Robotnik and his plans to turn all the animals into robots, and how a blue hedgehog needs to save them all by running really fast and jumping a lot. I don't remember much more of that exchange, but I know he was patient with me, and smiled, even though there's no way he could have seen that conversation as anything more than the nonsensical rambling of a child over their favorite toy. To be fair, that's pretty much what it was. But it's never stopped. Since discovering the internet, I spent more time on forums for games than the games themselves. I read reviews, previews, articles, news, forum threads, everything. I devoured everything I could read about games on the internet and never missed an opportunity to join in and argue on forums. Discovering YouTube was similarly revelatory, with a seemingly infinite wealth of intelligent gaming discussions from people who love the medium as much as I do. Some of it was satire, some of it news, some of it silly fluff, and some of it deeply heartfelt and emotional. Some of it was academic, some of it trivial, some of it refined, some of it crass. I loved it all and continue to. Reading, listening, and watching these people scratches that same itch that tore me away from Chemical Plant Zone, and I think maybe providing that content does the same for them. But what the heck is that itch exactly? Not all gamers have it. In fact, a lot of us seem not to. There are a ton of gamers who seem perfectly happy not discussing their hobby much at all, and who would rather just spend their free time playing games rather than reading about them. What is this thing that drags us away so profoundly from the thing we love? Commentators? Satirists? Critics? Academics? We all seem to be playing to the same tune, and it bothers me not to be able to say exactly what that is and what exactly to call these people. If there's one thing I hate, it's not being able to define or name a concept, but it's far worse when it's something this fundamental. What? I looked at different mediums like television, painting, and music, but I couldn't find anything that quite fit the bill. There was nothing quite like the magnetic power that games have to pull us close and then to push us away towards discussion. Maybe art was the wrong place to look then. Maybe the answer lies in the fridge instead. The more I thought about it, the more similar gaming and alcohol looked. They can be social bonding party experiences or they can make us feel alone. They can be colorful and bombastic, or they can be quiet and contemplative. They can be easy to swallow, or they can be harsh, strange, and difficult. Sometimes they can show us the cold and dark expanse of our own humanity. Sometimes they even have worms in them. GIANT WORM! 
Most importantly, they're both relatively expensive hobbies which can be strongly and dangerously addictive. There are a group of people called connoisseurs who drink very small quantities of alcohol and spend a lot of time discussing various qualities and comparing different types. It makes a lot of sense to do this because there's a finite and easily reachable threshold where you cannot enjoy or appreciate anymore, and it stops being art appreciation and simply becomes an expensive means to an end. The analogy kind of weakened for me at this point, though, because generally the word connoisseur is associated rather strictly with wine and nothing else. There are people in gaming who fit closely with this definition, who discuss and appreciate one specific type of game at a time. So the alcohol analogy wasn't a complete waste. Also, wouldn't a connoisseur who discussed multiple types of alcohol be some kind of meta-connoisseur? I was giddy for a moment because it felt like I was getting somewhere, but then I realized I have no idea what meta actually means. I had seen it used many times, but no one had ever stopped to explain it. It's a strange term, isn't it? The first time I can remember seeing the word meta is in Halo 3. There were a set of achievements which called on me to reach a certain score in the meta game. The what game? It didn't explain what they were, and there was no mention of the term outside the game's achievements. It turned out that the metagame achievements were the ones that involved reaching high scores on campaign levels. The next time I saw the term was on the League of Legends forum. See, in League of Legends, the metagame involves the balance of different champions with each other and how that balance affected the strategies and compositions used by the players in matches. When I thought about it, the term metagame was really strange. What do campaign score attacks in an FPS have to do with forum discussions about balance in a MOBA? The dictionary definition of meta is all over the place, with contradictory uses from different disciplines. It can mean a thing that's in front of, behind, beyond, and both more and less specialized than something else. Maybe that's why people throw it around so casually when they want to sound smart. Regardless, I think the third definition is the one we want. It refers to being larger and more comprehensive. The entry mentions that it's usually used in a new field of study that's critical of the one that preceded it. That might be useful later, but let's go back to the Halo and League of Legends examples. I think a metagame is a more inclusive thing with a wider scope that follows naturally from the game that precedes it. In the Halo example, the natural progression for a player who enjoys the mechanics of campaign levels is to maximize his or her skill at those levels. By doing so, a single attempt at each level becomes mini, with an overarching goal. If he or she compares their score with other players, the scope increases again, as now every one of those players' individual level runs and their campaign total are part of a larger whole. In League of Legends, the metagame of game balance follows naturally from the way the game works. The goal of individual matches is to win, and the best way to do that is to understand how to best organize the various factors involved in your character and team, bearing in mind what the other players are likely to do. The metagame involves communication with the larger community to learn from others how best to win. Again, the scope has zoomed out. What's interesting is that the developers of the game actually respond to metagame knowledge by changing the game's mechanics to make sure each individual match is as fun as possible. Players respond to this by trying to convince the developers to make specific changes that would benefit them in their ability to win, which effectively creates another level of the metagame. Seen in this light, the metagame starts to look like a tree. The roots of this tree are individual levels of a game. One campaign level, one playthrough, one match. Moving upwards, we add an extra layer. Competing with ourselves and others for high scores, fast runs, creative runs. We try and build better builds in teams for a better placement in PvP ladders. Moving up further, we end up in forums, comparing ourselves to and learning from other players. Maybe at this point we try and convince the developers to modify the game to better suit us. Before we climb any further, another example. This is King B Dogs, a developer for a hugely popular Minecraft mod by the name of The Aether. I popped into a stream where he was publicly developing the mod. 
In this image, 80% of the screen is taken up by incomprehensible code. I thought it was funny that the stream title proclaimed he was playing Minecraft, until I realized it was actually completely true. Minecraft is a game about creating things and modifying the world. Modifying the game itself is a clear progression. Making Minecraft is the metagame for Minecraft. Heck, if we go a step further, the metagame for Minecraft includes all of the people who take part in the Minecraft community. After all, without everyone else, there would be no one to play with the custom content made by people like King B Dogs. So, if a metagame is a broadening of scope, which involves more of the gaming community at each level, what would we end up with if we took another step up from the metagames I've described so far? For Minecraft, it's pretty clear. The natural progression from creating something in a game to creating something for the game leads to making your own game. At each level, the amount of players affected by your work increases, as does the scope of the project. People are clearly following this path, too. Thanks to the indie devs it's inspired, Minecraft has become as much of a genre as a game. Heck, even the new EverQuest MMO seems to be bending over backwards to let us dig holes. The shovel is the new gun. We've reached a point in the metagame where the entire gaming community is affected. Going back down a bit, we have Halo and League. Halo has its metagame achievements, which progress naturally into the larger metagame of achievement hunting and its forums and competitions. Halo and League also both include a competitive scene with forums and balance discussions. From here, one branch leads into the tournament scene, which includes professional gamers, dedicated sports-like fans, and enthusiastic commentators. Another branch leads from the give and take between community members and the devs and forums. We can go from trying to improve one game through discussion to trying to change many of them. An example. Here we have a video where a YouTube commentator known as Total Biscuit complained about the lack of a field of view slider in a game. The developers listened and implemented the change, improving it for those in the community who were affected by its absence. And now we've come full circle. Here are my commentators traveling up from small Let's Play boards to serious industry criticism on YouTube. Here are my satirists, traveling up from gaming-related doodles and flash videos to high-profile projects with Guillermo del Toro. Here are my academics, traveling from long forum posts that nobody reads to providing insight and joy to gamers and the industry alike. Gaming is the first artistic medium in human history where attaching meta to its name doesn't change its nature. Arguing about a book is different from reading or writing a book, because reading a book is passive. There's a reason nobody meta-reads a meta-book, or meta-watches a meta-movie. Gaming is by definition interactive, so everything we do related to gaming ties together in what amounts to one giant game. So now we're back to where we started. Why did I step away from gaming to bother my grandfather all those years ago? I never did, 